in case you're wondering about the cameras, um, ZDF, the control side is um, filming the speaker tonight. Uh, very good job. Okay, and now I am in the name of the support team. I may welcome our guests from Ukraine, our friends from Ukraine, Alona Karagal, Oleksandr Kenyuk, and Vasek Charapani. We are very, very happy to have you here, and we are so thankful that you take the time that you took all the effort to come here and during this horrific circumstances that you take the time to come to Vienna and talk to us and share with us your experiences with cultural workers. Yeah. Um, um, this, this talk tonight is part of a series of talks which is curated by Nasir Charakalin and our colleague Dominic Fortuna, who unfortunately cannot be here tonight, but will be watching. So hello, Dominic. <laughs> And Basil will moderate this evening and will introduce Alona and Oleksandr. Basil himself, Basil himself is, uh, is a curator and cultural scientist. He is head of the Visual Culture Research Center in Kiev, which is, was found 15 years ago as a collaboration between artists, activists, and academics, and plays a very active role. For example, you were supporting the events on Maidan, and you, and another very big example, you are organizers of the Kiev Biennials. So I say you were and are organized because it just started with the School of Kiev in 2015, and the biennial cycle continued and will be continued this year, 2023. Um, and so another example how. So vital your cultural work um, is resisting to this a bit more. And I pass the word to you, Vasi, to open the panel. And I ask you, uh, let's, uh, welcome our, uh, let's welcome our panel artists from Ukraine and the first. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Eva, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I take all what you said as a compliment for the future. I hope um, if there is any. Um, so, yeah, I'm really very pleased and honored to be here again and uh, very grateful to the Po for hosting this uh, series of events. Uh, this is, as Eva already pointed out, uh, the second one. So I would especially like to thank to Dominic, Eva, and Sarah for making this uh, possible, and also to our guests tonight, with uh, whom I, uh, I I will present uh, and introduce uh, in a minute. Uh, just uh, a short uh, intro from my side um, to to highlight this uh, this uh, aspect of of the of the series of events uh, in particular um, because. Uh, Mm, we uh, deliberately uh, have chosen an institutional aspect to emphasize within this series. Uh, so basically, uh, all the guests who are part of these uh, events are representing really very unique uh, and uh, special institutions. So basically, I would say that we somehow try also from a sociological in a perspective, try to make a kind of a cognitive mapping of the Ukrainian cultural field, what, what kind of modus operandi of the cultural field uh, institution-wise um, we have uh, during the uh, war and uh, occupation. And uh, this is uh, indeed a kind of a, also serving a documental in a way purpose uh, in the sense that uh, since also this, this event is, is being recorded, uh, so it's also really very important also maybe in retrospect uh, as well to, to take a look uh, at, the, at the specificity of uh, all those different uh, institutions because again, uh, as we uh, discussed uh, this, um, several times uh, so unlike uh, like the first thing that we have to keep in mind with regards to the ukrainian cultural context is basically that uh, it's not uh, typified like it is for instance in the eu or elsewhere right so uh, there is no kind of um, uh, 
functional special way of doing things in culture in Ukraine. So each each institution is going somehow in a way like uncharted territory, right? Because the, the, there is no common method to do things. There is no one idea how to make exhibitions or conduct a discursive program and so on. So each institution is following its own path. And uh, our idea is basically to, to, to highlight uh, these uh, various approaches and uh, especially how they are being affected um, by the, by the uh, war uh, developments. And, uh, but this also series, I have to say, is also serving um, a political purpose, uh, obviously. So it's uh, for for all of us definitely, as as you of course understand, war is not just some kind of uh, backdrop or a kind of a topic that we just discuss. Or this is exactly that's why it's about institutions, not so much about artists or curators. Right, but about institutional representatives, just exactly because it is these infrastructures that is, that is being targeted deliberately and going through the unbelievable hardship. But it is exactly because of this uh, persistence of these uh, of these uh, institutions that, in general, cultural field is able to to operate in Ukraine. Right, because without them, uh, we wouldn't have. We would be really in 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 a total uh, desert. Though we are. We partly, definitely uh, are. So my pleasure to to introduce uh, our guest tonight um, uh, to Alona Karawai, who who is physically luckily with us. Uh, Alona is a co-founder of uh, Insha Osita, uh, another education uh, organization, and uh, she is also running a residency house uh, in the Ukrainian Capacitan Mountains uh, called Hata Maisternia, a workshop hut, I believe. And she is also um, running the gallery space in ivano frankivsk in the city in the west of Ukraine, uh, as assortment room. Uh, and at the same time, she is also one of the editors of the new media outlet, which just was recently launched, uh, called Post Impresa, about art developments in, in especially in in this uh, uh, re, uh, in this uh, part of uh, Ukraine, especially in ivano frankivsk uh, and and this uh, Precarpathian region. And Alexander uh, Teluk, uh, who is joining us online from uh, from Kiev, uh, who is a film scholar, uh, film director. And he is also the head of the archive department of the uh, Alexander Dozhenko National Film Center. And uh, he has curated many film programs, uh, exhibitions at the numerous film festivals, uh, but also at the Film Museum of the Dozhenko Center itself. And he's also a film director and artist. And uh, for the, uh, in that role, he co-founded uh, an art union called uh, Ruins uh, Collective. And this is also interestingly enough, uh, somehow that uh, both uh, institutional representatives and both institutions who, are, uh, who will be speaking today uh, are also uh, partners of the Kyiv Biennial uh, with the Dozhenko Center. We have been collaborating almost since the very beginning, since 2015. And with uh, Alona, um, we have been working uh, uh, with the Kyiv Biennial uh, like um, in the manner that uh, our uh, emergency support initiative that we launched on behalf of the Kyiv Biennial uh, after the full-scale invasion uh, was also very much in, in close collaboration with the assortment room uh, gallery space in Ivano uh, Frankivsk. So uh, basically, uh, format-wise, our talk will be structured uh, today the following way that uh, we will have a, an exchange and uh, talk um, among our guests, and uh, then we can have some Q&A. And afterwards, um, there will be a film screening, and Alexander will present uh, this uh, this film uh, from the yeah. He will tell more about it from the 1930s. Um, so uh, first of all, if I may start with uh, with you, Alona, uh, so what I think would be also like, especially in the international audience, uh, uh, to hear. Um, Somehow, if you could somehow briefly outline uh, the specificity of, of uh, your initiatives that you launched and have been running, especially, I think, uh, in this context, would be interesting to hear about the residency house and the, and the gallery space. And um, 
what has changed uh, basically since last or pre last already february uh, how these uh, modus operandi that you have uh, was affected by by the war directly thank you thank you Vasil. thank you all for coming uh, today in the evening to uh, to be a part of this event um, my name is Alona, and actually for us, like modus operandi has changed a lot in uh, 2014 when the previous phase of war has started, uh, because actually we started to work in 2008, so it's like 15 years or something like that. And uh, we started as a bottom-up initiative. We started back then with community work and with political education in a broad sense of world and came on some moment to culture and arts as a very strong instrument for political education. And uh, during these 15 years, together with uh, our friends and counterparts, we were growing bigger. We created what, what we call a family of organizations uh, Vasil has mentioned in Shaosvita, it's uh, our first NGO, which is still there and doing mostly uh, non-formal educational formats. And later on, we were founding some other organizations. In a way, uh, we were going to different regions uh, and uh, also leaving our trades uh, there. And um, in 2014, when many people out of our community had to change to relocate to place they're living. And also me, I was living in Donetsk in 2014 on 4th of May on the day of the referendum. And I was thinking back then, okay, it will be lasting for two months as maximum and uh, I will come up to September back, which have not happened till now. Um, and then we started to op operate like a little bit more in the Western part of Ukraine. This is when we came there. And probably we start with photos just to show some visual impressions for you, just to make an idea how it looks like. And so when um, 24th of February started, uh, I had um, a bit like um, deja vu on these dates. But the most interesting thing that uh, me as a person, I was operating somehow the same and had the same um, assumptions we did not, which did not work out. Uh, this is, for example, the first uh, photo what we have done in March, in the beginning of March, together with Jason Momenko, who relocated uh, from Kyiv to Ivano Frankivsk. And we started uh, together a residency with her as curator, just a moment there make it more beautiful, um, even more beautiful as it is. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's uh, Lester Komenko who just came uh, to us to our space uh, and she told us, okay, I would like to volunteer. What do you need to do? We also had some goods which were going through us, some medical goods, some military goods. And she basically came not as curator, not as artist, but as a person. She said, okay, I would like to help somehow but pretty fastly we have recognized okay we do this work but we also start stay with cultural work this is uh, how we came to the point where we found this founded this residency and i was uh, telling today to vasil it was the first day when i changed my clothes because on 24th of february i came to the office uh, in some kind of black hoodie and i said okay it will be fast over it's maximum one week it cannot last longer like nobody would accept such open war in, in europe it's not possible and i'm just wearing the same outfit each day and i will change after it's over and it was the first day i changed it it was after 10 days because i thought mm, no probably not 10 days and probably even not two months, unfortunately. And we have to uh, uh, like go on a more long run initiatives. On the 24th of uh, February, we started evacuation program. We thought how we can be helpful for our colleagues. And so as we are in relatively safe space, we could host people and we could host artifacts. And this is something what I also like the help I would expect or I would like to have from the colleagues when I was closer to the front line to have a safe space where I could bring my collection. I could bring my people and my artifacts. And basically we started that. 
uh, we were not the only one initiatives in Ukraine like that. There were a few of them. And uh, for example, this is one of the cases what we could evacuate. This and the next photo, this is the, oh no, no, it's only one, sorry. Uh, it's the family archive of Fedor Tetyanich, who is an avant-garde avant -garde artist uh, from, from Ukraine. And uh, we could evacuate his archive only from the third try. It was try number three. It was in his family house close to Kiev. Uh, the roads uh, were not like possible to cross back then. And uh, we were all, uh, already like losing hope that we could do it. But like our driver has done a great job and was very persistent. And he said, okay, if we have to go five times, try five times, we'll try five times. Um, now we can speak about that uh, because uh, like the collection is now uh, is going on exhibition crew in European museums. It was shown in Berlin, it was uh, shown in Vienna, it was a smaller exhibition in Woods and um, now in two days the exhibition will open in Dresden and Bertinium where this collection is. So it's basically going, uh, uh, going uh, um, to exhibitions. Besides of that, we're still having shelter with some amount of other works which are there, conserved, and uh, just not to lose time, we're trying to work with restoration of some of these works because we do not know how long they should stay with us and we're just trying to use this time wisely to do something for these works, like to digitalize them and uh, to restaurate them. Besides of that, in this initiative of the um, residency, this is a residency house uh, Vasil was talking about. It's an old hut uh, in, in mountains. It was built in 1939 by the local family. Probably a rich one because it's a big house uh, for, for, for that time. We founded it in 2014-15 when we basically were relocated by ourselves. And uh, it was some uh, wish to create homes. When you lose your own home, you create some other homes in other spaces. And this is how we started Hata Maesternia. And in, um, when COVID started, it was very useful for us to have it, our own space, our temporary autonomous zone, how I call it, because we started micro residences with, with two or three artists during COVID in June. Like with the with this amount of people, which was um, accepted by, by them to have it, and we could continue our residency program because it was our space uh, with our rules. And uh, also in um, 2022, it was also very good that we could have it because we had additional shelter for people back then. Uh, and on the next photo, you can also see how it looks like. So it's. It's a very, I don't know, home <laughs> atmosphere. This is where artists could work. Uh, we got also support uh, via Kiev Biennale for this residency. And it was residency, which was called Working Room, curated by Lesa Fomenko, who also said, OK, we need it for a few weeks, for several weeks. It lasted three months. Like the artists were staying three months. Overall, it was 30 artists. Some of them were just there. Some of them had the feeling they had to produce, they have to create something. Like uh, approximately the half were working on the new works and later on we were showing them on different exhibitions. But it was not the, the goal from the very beginning to produce something. The goal was to create the space where people can find their way back to practice and to themselves and they could then decide what to do. And actually it's very interesting because uh, before February of last year, we were not production oriented. Uh, we have done very process oriented residences on Hata Maesternia. Our last residences were devoted to the question how we can do a residency without producing, zero print residency, and so on. And uh, when uh, this phase of war started, it was an organic wish from artists. Um, as a reaction to produce a lot. When, when uh, a lot is being lost on other sport here, you try to produce, of course, it will not be compensating the things which are lost, but still it was like this um, wish to do it. And during this residency, around 70, uh, 70, 70 groups 
uh, were created, which was completely a lot for us. We, we never have done things like that. But in this residency, we said, okay, we're doing that. Uh, in summer, we were also working with teenagers. You have seen, you can see these photos here with teenagers who relocated to Ivano Frankiv uh, Frankivsk from other cities of Ukraine. And we said, okay, being teenager is an internal war on itself. It's complicated on itself. And when in this age, you have to come to a new community and try to find new friends and try to find yourself, it's uh, like, it feels like horror a little bit. And we said, okay, we're gonna do some meeting points for local teenagers and for those who came. And they are somehow also connected with artistic practices, with uh, urban interventions, uh, with a little bit hooligan actions in the city. So the teenagers just feel the city as their own. When they start to interact with that, they're feeling it's my place. So basically we were doing a little bit land art with them, a little bit graffiti. They were also doing their project. And here are a few photos of the exhibitions we were doing just for you also to get a grasp of what was going on in it's mostly summer and autumn. Uh, it started to be very crowded uh, uh, in, in the gallery. I think one of the reasons for that, uh, because this silent art, art which does not need sound, which does not need words, uh, visual art, started to be more understandable to people or something they could um, uh, they could come in contact with. So we have seen like much, much more people coming to us uh, since the beginning of uh, this phase of war. This is what happened. And uh, last but not least, uh, in April of last year, we decided that we will create this post impresa. This is something we were thinking about also earlier on that we need to create a media which is telling about artistic process in this region a library, also to digitalize some old catalogs and so on. And then it was in April, I was two days on Hata Maestana together with artists because I was mostly staying in Ivano Frankis. It was like a lot of to do. But then I remember we were there sitting in the evening and uh, uh, we were speaking about this idea and then we said, okay, we have to do it. Like it's, it's, it's probably a little bit hopeless idea to make a media about art in April, 2022. And we also started the physical library of catalogs and like collecting also books. It was also in a way something which is not very risk free, but we said, okay, we still try to do it because it's some kind of um, reaction to that or some kind of action what we can do uh, in the answer of the uh, situation. And basically now we are continuing with that um, uh, Ivano Frankivsk is a city uh, which is close to the Polish border. We need around, I would need around four hours with the car to come to Polish border. But what we are trying now, we are trying also, and I'm trying to go more in Ukraine and to see what is going on in other places as well. One of the photos was the photo from the exhibition in Dnipro we were doing. It's this one, yes, um, uh, like, uh, last year in December, like during blackouts. Uh, last Saturday, I was in Kramatorsk, which is 40 kilometers from Bakhmut, just trying to see what is going on and what is feasible and not feasible to do in different uh, places. So basically more or less. Yeah, yeah just uh, before I uh, switch to, uh, uh, to Zoom, um, maybe just one follow-up question uh, to you, Alona. Uh, so basically, uh, like as far as I can grasp it all together, so the 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 the, uh, the main sort of strategies that you embrace um, are basically those connected to to shared time and space, right? Sharing experience, also physically, and at the same time, in parallel, uh, like different kinds of uh, archival strategies in order to somehow to refer also maybe to something stable, perhaps maybe it also has a kind of a psychotherapeutic background, maybe. Uh, but at the same time, I, I'm also wondering, like from, from this kind of experience that before the uh, February, last February and, and afterwards, what, what uh, how would you describe, like, what will, if, if any, what was the turn in, in, in the media that artists are willing to use? 
right? What has changed with regards to like how these strategies that you were following or, or embracing, how that change uh, the, 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 the way artists work with the media and uh, for that matter, what's your take on, on uh, which media you consider as the most effective ones as the, at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question, actually. Yeah, because like from the institutional point of view, the instruments we are using, we started to work a lot of the spaces in 2014. We started to value those spaces. When you lose something, you start to value that. Because before we were working almost 10 years, we just did not need a space. When you are in a safe space, you do not need your own physical space because you would have like other ones. And uh, in uh, 2022, we continued to work with spaces, but started also to make archives. This is uh, uh, one more reaction. When you start to lose it, you do it. Uh, the artists we are working with, uh, what I could see, many of them um, started to change the media they were working with, because uh, I had the feeling uh, some of them would say, my old media is not enough. I cannot verbalize what is going on through my old media. Not all of them, but like uh, many of those with whom we've been working, they were trying new media. And it was also like the question, how can I put into message, how can I put into artistic work what is going on? Because it's like, um, it's something very complicated. Uh, some of the artists, like uh, one of the works you have shown, it was a work of Sasha Kurmas. For example, Sasha Kurmas doing like this very, sure. yeah, yeah, very activist work, uh, and uh, who was not able, for example, to work with photography. He he was uh, uh, he he was willing to work with photography also in the first months in Ivanov Kiev. It uh, started to be super complicated to work with photography because you have to be accredited. It's it's very dangerous to make photos and so on. And for example, he started to work with the uh, images he found online. And this is what also many artists would do. Like they would be working with the images from social networks they would find uh, online and bring it uh, like to their works. For example, also like. Um, Mm, many works of Nikita Kadan are based mm -hmm. on the photographs from the social mm -hmm. networks. Uh, many works from Lesa Komenko are coming uh, from the cell phone photos of her husband who is now in the army. He's sending the photos and she's working also with the photos with these images of people. So basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, we, we'll go on just. Uh, um... <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay, Alexander, do you hear me well? Uh, again, this stupid Zoom question, but yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, so I will, I will kindly ask you to 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 keep okay, the microphone. Sure. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, thanks so much. So uh, yeah, the, the question is basically more or less the same, but uh, but uh, actually, uh, yeah, if, if you could, yeah, characterize uh, the, the specific uh, features of of the Dovzhenko Film Center because I think what is really most important that perhaps also um, people from the outside uh, Ukrainian authorities unfortunately included cannot really understand the, the multi-layered structure and multifaceted character of, of this indeed unique uh, institution and for that matter maybe also you could somehow position your your center uh, within the uh, kind of general framework of the uh, cultural policies in Ukraine, and how do you see this? Uh, yeah, at all. Okay. Yes. Thank you for the question. First of all, uh, thank you very much to Vasil for inviting me, and uh, for Depo and Dominic, Eva, and Sarah, and Aliona for the participation on this conversation. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Uh, not attend personally with you, and I'm sorry that I. Uh, haven't uh, pre prepared uh, images illustrations, so I will just talk, and you will be imagine how, how it works. So yeah, the Dozhenka Center, opposite to uh, NGOs that Alona mentioned, it is a state institution, which is which is important. Uh, it is the largest Ukrainian ar film archive, and it has collections that include. 7,000 feature films and also documentaries and animation films and also thousands of archival records from the history of Ukrainian cinema. Uh, but the Center not only archive uh, uh, because the institution that acts as an umbrella for several uh, different uh, departments 
for example, we have seven climate controlled film walls for preserving film materials and uh, 35 millimeters, you know, positive and negative prints. Also, we have film museum, we have non-film archive, we have um, a library and publishing department. So uh, all these departments are a part of one institution. And also the center is uh, like an international player because we are the only member of International Federation of Film Archive in Ukraine, which is quite uh, the, main, the main organization in this uh, sphere. Uh, the mission of the Zenko Center is uh, our inner uh, idea to, is to develop a, a fresh approach to uh, Ukrainian uh, conventional history of cinema and Ukrainian history of cinema. And uh, we also work with transformation of some national memory through the cinema. And uh, we develop some culture of mindfulness in watching and understanding Ukrainian films. Uh, it's, it's, I guess it's very important, uh, especially now, because of uh, we all a, a big part of this heritage, 70 years of this, our Ukrainian film history is, uh, is, was during Soviet uh, epoch. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, narratives in these films quite obsolete and propagandistic. So we, we, we should uh, to rethink it them again. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, full-scale Russian invasion uh, broke our uh, usual work and uh, provoked a tremendous risk, uh, first of all, to our collection, to films, to documents. And because even uh, this, our professional walls, uh, they couldn't protect, of course, uh, from uh, some war accident or like uh, missile uh, attack or some fire. Uh, also, we have such uh, an obstacle like uh, a part of our team uh, left the country and also a part of our team were mobilized to the Armed Forces of Ukraine, which is also uh, made our uh, team weaker somehow. Um, or uh, in winter, we had these uh, electric power cuts, and they were quite frequent and unscheduled, uh, which was badly influenced uh, to climate uh, system in our walls. And uh, that's why uh, uh, the dem permanent presence of our staff uh, should be like uh, the they should should work more and more because the, to control this uh, all these parameters in uh, these uh, film walls. Uh, uh, but uh, also this was first war year. We have some uh, results. We have some. We had some achievements, uh, and uh, despite the war, we had a lot of invitations, and uh, the Zhenka Center received dozens requests for film screenings for some film discussions and uh, in Ukraine but also uh, in international level uh, inside the country we had a lot of screenings in the different cultural uh, centers in spaces especially in western regions uh, but also we had some screenings in film festivals and what is uh, significant that we had uh, screenings uh, in first in the very first uh, months of war, we had screenings in, in bomb shelters and also in the Kiev underground station where inhabitants of city were sheltered from these missile strikes. And of course, uh, in in the uh, abroad in different countries, we also had a lot of invitations. For example, well-known Cinematheque Frances, uh, I film, film Museum in Amsterdam, uh, Filmatheca Catalonia, such uh, uh, institutions that we really admire, uh, were it invited us to present Ukrainian films and they uh, arranged Ukrainian retrospectives, which was also quite valuable for us. Some of these screenings were also for a stage, not only for film screening, but also for some discussions. Some of these discussions were quite hot because we have this conversation about our colonial past of Ukraine and also of some motives or reason why we should cancel some Russian films or Russian culture. So it was very interesting period. It's it's hard, very hard period, but 
in some terms, it's, it was also quite interesting uh, frame to exchange of ideas with our international partner, partners and audiences. Right, and also I think uh, like uh, an another issue which uh, I find really particularly important to touch upon is basically uh, um, how uh, how your relationship with the Ukrainian state uh, has been and changed in the in the recent years, and basically what what kind of uh, threats and challenges are you facing? Because I think, like, basically for the especially international audiences and representatives of different institutions, I think this center uh, does require full <laughs> full scale uh, solidarity support because it's indeed on on the brink. And maybe you can just also outline that that aspect because it's really. Mm, yeah, I think it's crucial. Okay. Yes, it's a uh, it's a very big topic because uh, we had, despite of war, we had this uh, inner conflict in, in Ukraine. So uh, in August it was case, and in August the center, despite all these achievements, uh, uh, by it, uh, our state film agency, which is uh, the executive body of uh, our institution. Uh, this uh, executive body is issued an order of uh, so-called reorganization of the center, uh, which de facto meant when we read it, we we discovered that it de, de facto it meant dividing of our film collection. And this decision was really shocked and surprised not only for uh, our team, but also for the whole Ukrainian and international film community. Uh, defenders of the Zenka Center uh, planet to arrange some protests to demonstrate the importance of the archive, but uh, during wartime, such public actions are forbidden. For forbidden. So the center uh, have uh, only such methods like uh, letters of support, and we, we received a lot of such kind of letters from uh, International Federation of Film Archive, from Polish and Ukrainian film academies, from a, a lot of international renowned film archives and institutions. Uh, or we, we have uh, this uh, case, this petition to the Ukrainian Prime Minister, uh, which is demanded to annul this film agency order. Uh, and this petition, uh, it gained uh, more than 25,000 uh, votes, which is really, really a lot to, uh, for a cultural issue. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, the result was negative. Uh, the, the, we get some answers from government, but uh, this decision by uh, film agency's uh, decision was suspended, but not annulled. So it's still active more or less. And uh, yeah, unfortunately the future of the center remains uh, quite harsh and uh, ambiguous and unclear. Uh, one more. Uh, one more point to tr for our troubles is uh, that uh, we started this year, 2023 year, without a director because uh, the contract with our director was uh, finished and uh, her name is Olena Goncharuk. Uh, Olena Goncharuk uh, won the call to the position of the director, but neither Ministry of Culture nor State Film Agency accepted the results and uh, sign the contracts with you, so it's it's also a problem. And furthermore, uh, we are a state institution. We really depend on uh, funding from the government. And this year, uh, the funding was uh, decreased again. So we, I could even um, uh, tell you the amount. If uh, previous year we had uh, we had a budget. Uh, uh, 195,000 uh, euros. This year we have only 139,000. Uh, uh, and for institution where 50 per people uh, works, it's extremely uh, humble amount, I guess. So this situation is really, really uh, bad for us. I sometimes I uh, I really surprised how we still uh, exist, how we still work but uh, uh, we, re we really have a, a very uh, powerful team of professionals. I guess that's why we, they understand what, what they're doing and uh, 
struggle, uh, keep struggling in this, even in this terrible situation. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe Alona also we could touch upon um, those educational projects or alternative educational projects that you have been also running, and maybe that do you do you have any interactions between those educational programs with the uh, art activities or like social activities, especially with kids? I think it, this is a. In particular, important uh, just under the current circumstances when millions of, of people are moving back and forth somehow. Yeah, basically, they're of course very much interconnected. In uh, 2015, sorry, uh, we have started a program which lasted like around five or six years. It was a program which was called which was called uh, Life History Workshop. It was a program which was reflecting the modern history of Ukraine. And it was a program where different people could participate, students, uh, history teachers, artists, journalists, and so on. And they basically were going through a series of workshops, could take any topic they are interested, in, which is connected to the modern history of Ukraine, especially those uh, uh, aspects uh, which are creating conflicts and tensions in the society and make a project about that. Uh, two years in a row, we were doing also a festival, a festival of life histories. It was in Kiev on Vodenka, and like through this project, it was also interconnected. We had artistic projects, we had educational projects there, we had something uh, like uh, on the intersection, uh, community project, and our, our goal was to create also a wish to reflect on the history when the history is so complicated, is so interconnected, is so connected with tensions that I don't want to like think about that. And also to create a wish to work with that, but uh, to work with that in a participatory way, in a more ecological way, and um, to create also this multi-perspective uh, historical approach. This is what we were basically doing um, to approximately like um, to I think it was till 2020 and uh, now after the full-scale invasion we are continuing to work a lot uh, with teenagers this program that I was showing you before we are doing these workshops also in different cities it's in a way a series of workshops uh, and we're also seeing that these teenagers are creating their own community they are starting also to make their own artistic interventions. Some of them are very much also artistically interested. And so basically we are trying to keep them together also to uh, like not to create more agency for them, but also to create a space when they know they have this agency to co-create what, what is going on. Right, right. Also, <clears throat> for the minute, yeah, uh, I was also um, uh, writing down what you uh, said before. I think this uh, particular feature that you mentioned, uh, this change of uh, change of the media by many many artists, exactly because they feel that they uh, cannot verbalize or express themselves properly with the ones they used to have. I think this is really something uh, to be uh, noted um, carefully. And uh, for them, yeah, I, I was also thinking that's basically also a question about. Uh, uh, art language right and um, yeah and this is something which is uh, because like this change of the media is basically uh, is ba yeah it mirrors the situation that um, and it shows just really openly how how the war affects and makes you speechless right and you you have to find kind of another language of some sort in order to to speak out but you cannot and it's also the, the question how to speak about the unspeakable yeah even i cannot you, you see it's uh, the unconscious doesn't make mistakes yeah so it is really yeah i mean that um so for that matter, i'm really interested what what kind of changes you 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 observe or what kind of tendencies in the in the in the contemporary art language, or maybe you can already somehow uh, evaluate what is emerging in, in in the Ukrainian art field? Like maybe something already new, right? Yeah, there, there, yeah. You already mentioned that, but maybe you you can somehow maybe not not, not predict, but already see some forthcoming uh, tendencies which are somehow crucial for the field. Yeah. 
I would first comment on what you said, like, okay, how we can speak about something which is unspeakable, yeah, and then you work, like, in a way with images, with some bigger images, and, for example, so as we had last year three residences uh, of people, these were very different residences, this first residency was a long one working room, was an urgency residency, it was with a lot of energy of people, with a lot of anger, with a lot of anger, which were then transformed into this production or overproduction. In summer, uh, we have done a residency to hold the topic of future. Uh, we did not have any results uh, after that, which is not surprising, but we tried it uh, at least. And it was also my wish to say, okay, guys, we, uh, I'm just fed up to speak about memory and history. I'm working with that like since 10 years. Let's look into future, but we failed. Like uh, it was a good residency. There were like good discussions, but we did not manage like to make any message out of out, out of that. And then in winter we have done uh, a residency about about memory. It's about commemoration and had also some results after that. And it was very exciting to see how these common images of people mm -hmm. uh, like moving from one image to another, because in this first residency of working room, in this uh, residency, like all field, like with this energy and anger, uh, artists were working a lot with the topic of soil, of earth. Later on, when Mestetsky Arsenal had this exhibition out of uh, um, heart of earth, I was not surprised because this is something what I have seen from the artists. They were like painting the soil without and like uh, how it transforms something, how it transforms bodies or dead bodies, how it can also give birth to something new and so on. And then later on in half a year when we had the residency, uh, we had uh, the main image of the tree then. And we had the exhibition which was called Behind the Tree is a Tree. And it was for me like the next stage and a little bit like, um, uh, also sad recognition because tree is about resilience tree behind the tree that we are standing behind each other like these trees but it's also the reflection that uh, this is a long thing this will last for a long time and I'm not speaking about like the military actions I will hope I hope that they will end like, like the, the military um, end of this war will be over but like the post-war period will be very, very long. This is what we see. And it was a sad recognition of these uh, images of trees which were there. Uh, and how we were working also with this unspeakable, because we also could not do it. Um, in this first residency working room, uh, we had on Thursdays uh, just circles with artists when they were sharing their everything. <laughs> how they work on their artworks, how they manage or fail to do something. And uh, uh, I was doing um, like so, as we were not always meeting all of us, uh, we had a chat and I was doing like short, um, like um, notice. And I, I was making like a short telegram on that, like, like just telling like Nikita said that and Katya said that and so on. Uh, and then in the end, uh, we have put it together. We have also translated it into one of the exhibitions in Essen, we just put it on the walls uh, like a newspaper, what people were discussing, because uh, they were basically discussing very uncensored um, things. For example, they were discussing also dehumanization. Is it okay for me as an artist who used to uh, identify himself or herself as a left artist uh, to, um, mm, uh, to um, watch dead bodies of Russian soldiers and do not feel anything. Is it okay or not okay for me? How do I work with that? Is it okay for me to use the images of weapons also as an artist who would never do this before? Uh, is it okay or not okay to do that? And we have brought all of these uncensored discussions just on the walls and uh, made also some of the works um, as, uh, as images to that so that the people can see through which uh, reflections the artistic scene is coming, or like through which reflections, through which transformation the whole society is coming. Is it okay what is happening to me right now, or is it already not okay? So it's basically like not bringing this answer, but like to document the discussion which is going on. It's probably later on some more uh, clever people would say what did it mean all, but like if, 
they have the ground for it if they have this uh, written down. Yeah, I mean, how to be a human under the current circumstances is uh, really, I mean, there is no clear answer, unfortunately. And uh, as for Alexander, I was also thinking, uh, like, to, to ask you as a, uh, as a film director and a, as a film historian uh, in this uh, context, um, how do you perceive and uh, what's your somehow interpretation? Because there is, as you of course know, there is this common sort of already kind of a common place that this war is being referred to as a most documented war in history, right? I mean, that's it's just the online wars going on, like uh, we, we, we are getting reports on, on the like ongoing basis, actually, even before the actual events. Uh, uh, are taking place uh, pretty often. Um, so, uh, and uh, in this context, uh, yeah, perhaps also you are part of this trend. Uh, the, the most of uh, many Ukrainian artists, but also not only artists, but the journalists and others are really very much involved or dedicate most of their time into documenting things, various things, right? Some are busy with documenting Russian war crimes, some are just documenting uh, ordinary people or everyday life or like different types of experiences that we are we are we are going through uh, so uh, do, how do you refer to that as a, as an artist yourself as a film historian so do you do and yeah so what's how, how would you um, formulate the political potentiality of of the film as a medium right if you especially if you look at some of the the, the films that you have in your archive like in retrospect uh, if you refer to that historically what's your take on that uh, thank you for the question uh, of course uh, as you know uh, film is a time-based uh, media but uh, not only in terms Time is essential part of film media itself, but not only in these terms, but also in uh, terms of development, because uh, to uh, create, to finish film, to product it, you need uh, some amount of time. Anyhow, it's not a very, it's not a quick medium, and uh, that's why it's medium that's always a bit uh, slow and uh, late with its, with its images. Uh, the situation that we have now, we have a lot of documentaries, chronicles uh, online, but uh, it's uh, not not all of them. It's uh, like uh, it's a raw material, and not of course not all of them are close to cinema itself, cinema medium itself. But of course, a lot of uh, them, and I agree with uh, Alona that uh, artists and directors they include. Uh, these images to their works and it's also very very popular approach now to just to uh, use some uh, anonymous uh, if a shot from social media into the frame of the uh, film itself uh, but also I would like to rethink this idea I really like this idea your previous idea about very specific uh, form of Ukrainian uh, culture infrastructures, uh, uh, culture institution fields, because uh, yeah, all of them need to all times to, to an old generation they need to reinvent some new methods and the situation which we have now it's uh, as a situation when Ukrainian authorities, Ministry of Culture and Ukrainian State Film Agency, they are not support enough Ukrainian directors and authors and. Uh, uh, almost all the films that appeared during the war time, they appeared uh, without uh, government uh, bodies, executive bodies help. And so uh, it's not only about uh, some uh, funding, but also in some informational support, etc. And uh, it's not bad because uh, it's uh, it helps uh, to, for directors to find some other sources and uh, they are not uh, uh, very uh, they are not create some kind, a kind of uh, big films about it and it, it allows them to also to move faster and to prepare their films 
of course they were they will be cheaper the films but they were will be also uh, faster and uh, find their audience uh, not in uh, two years after the production started but uh, uh, sooner and of course uh, the main for my as my point uh, point of view and uh, i didn't uh, create any new uh, per per personal uh, uh, video projects in film projects but my own approach and i really like if i found this method in someone's uh, artistic works it's uh, of course uh, uh, the uh, way of uh, uh, investigation of crime. So I think that this is uh, it, it should be the main, uh, of course, not, not the only, but uh, for, for, for my opinion, it should be the main uh, idea for documentaries, especially for documentary films now, not some maybe poetical uh, uh, discovering and thinking about all these uh, geopolitical uh, circumstances, but uh, very concrete, very doc document. Uh, investigation crime. I guess it's the main approach of the artist in Ukraine now. Yeah, thanks so much. And also, perhaps, uh, just to give also our audience uh, time, some time to ask uh, possibly questions, uh, uh, I would like to ask you both, um, since you have been uh, collaborating with your foreign counterparts uh, really a lot. Uh, so that's basically the question about international uh, level, right? Uh, so uh, what has been your uh, inter-institutional collaborative experience so far, especially after the, the uh, full-scale invasion uh, started? And uh, so, and, and, and for that matter, uh, what do you think is, is actually lacking in terms of uh, institutional cooperation or understanding or uh, approaches in, uh, in, from on, on the side of your, so what is your view of your foreign counterparts? What they don't get institutionally, structurally, uh, mentally, politically, <laughs> ideologically as well? Yeah, first of all, I would like to say that the solidarity way uh, was felt a lot. And like, I'm very thankful for all the international partners, just galleries, uh, people, artists who uh, reached to us in the first days and were helping on, on, on different ways. It, it was helping really a lot and it was like different kind of support. For example, we also had a gallery with which we were collaborating in Poland and they said okay guys we've collected uh, some medical bags we know only you in Ukraine could you please forward it uh, where it's needed so it was uh, really um, when we uh, uh, say about the institutions uh, what I can observe from my perspective um, uh, I think it's, it's probably very obvious uh, we have different speeds and uh, this speed, uh, it's not only connected to the current situation of an active war, it's also connected to some other things. And the Ukrainian speed uh, will not uh, be, like we will not be less speedy as, as we are, and European institution will not be less slow as they are. And on this moment, we would have to find a way to each other, how to collaborate with each other so that we both uh, take benefit from it, but we still can come together. Because what I would predict that uh, like Ukrainian institutions or Ukrainians will get even faster after that, or they will get like in a way um, not having the resources like to explain so much as it has to be explained. and. This is what I'm thinking the, all of the time, how to find a compromise uh, on, on, on this moment. Would you like to stay uh, yourself, but still like to collaborate? Because, yeah. Yeah, but uh, perhaps you remember there was this idea of a Europe of two speeds, right? Uh, like a, as a geopolitical project. So it also very much reflects colonial attitudes between the metropole and the periphery, because periphery, of course, has different speeds, obviously. So yeah, Alexander, please, yeah. Yes, I agree that uh, this uh, new uh, network of solidarity between institutions, uh, it's, it, 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 it really, uh, it was really significant to build this 
revival of solidarity between institutions, especially when Ukrainian institutions were really vulnerable and fragile last year, and like some, some of them until now. Uh, the, this new network of international links uh, made, made our uh, institution really uh, stronger. And uh, I, I need to confess that uh, thanks to our international partners, the Schenker Center uh, 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 could still uh, function because, uh, for example, we had uh, the friend of us, uh, Richard Boston, who is a historian from Britain, he even uh, uh, arranged a uh, crowdfunding campaign for the Jenka Center and uh, it, uh, at GoFund.com. Uh, uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, that amount of money that we get from this crowdfunding uh, really helped us to not only to get salaries to our team, but also to uh, bought some uh, uh, elements to our climate uh, uh, control equipment, so it was it was really significant. Uh, one more uh, discovery, and it's also that uh, our international partners um, made a big step in this uh, uh, understanding what is Ukraine is, uh, what is Ukrainian history is, and what is the difference between Ukrainian and uh, Russian. For example, in film history, when you ha have this common history, common film history, uh, they started to understand that some of films were produced in Ukraine, some of them were produced in Russian, and this common uh, view that it's like some Soviet or post-Soviet uh, heritage, it's not works anymore. It was also uh, uh, one of achievements of uh, previous year. Uh, and uh, my big hope that uh, this uh, solidarity won't stop because, uh, of course, everyone is exhausted of war in Ukraine, especially in Ukraine. But I feel now that not only in Ukraine, that Ukraine was a hot topic last year, but maybe this year we have uh, less amount of requests and but war is ongoing and it's it became more cruel and more terrible so uh, i hope that this support and this solidarity won't stop because without this solidarity our institution unfortunately in ukraine say even without uh, government support without international solidarity i think that uh, couldn't revive yeah, thank you. So, yeah, thanks so much uh, for the talk. I, I would suggest that we open up it for, for you guys. And uh, if you have a question, just uh, take, you can take a microphone. Uh, yeah, Eva has a microphone, so yeah. she will assist. Uh, just for, for Alexander to hear it properly. Yeah, for, um, we have the microphone, uh, but you can follow, if you refuse to be the voice being recorded, it's your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will repeat. Yeah. Yeah, because we we just reserved some time for for the questions because. Uh, we decided to make it like right after the, the talk itself uh, because uh, afterwards we will have a film screening that Alexander will present. And uh, so just uh, you can use this opportunity. Also, you can be filmed on, on TV. Uh, that's also a nice option to have. I can chat about uh, yeah. tendencies so far because I have forgotten about your question before <laughs> when okay. I was talking and then just repeat something that mm -hmm. which is happening. Uh, what I also mentioned uh, shortly that uh, we started to get like much more audience and this audience is very diverse. It's not like this homogeneous audience that we used to have in the gallery. It's really super, super different, super different people are coming. And what I said before that uh, we were having really uh, hard times uh, with our like sound and music projects. We were also working on that. In the first half year, we could not work with anything which is connected to sound. But we have seen that uh, like the people who 
came from this from this scene. They were coming to uh, uh, to the galleries, and um, this is probably also the point where contemporary art uh, finds this language, which is speaking to people, to ordinary people. Like I mean, all people are ordinary, but like you know, you know what I mean. And uh, uh, when it's so close to people, and they start to understand it, they start to understand this. Uh, weird uh, solutions uh, of the groups, they start to ask it, they start to read explications, they start to ask questions, they start to say, why are you doing that? Or like, it's good that you are doing that. And this is what we have seen so that uh, like some kind of big barrier, which was there earlier on, it's like, I would not say it vanished, but it's, it's, it's much lower. And this is what I also see when I visit the exhibitions in Kiev, in, in the States, Arsenal, and so on, that we are so close uh, to the topics, or probably we are just closer to each other. It could be also that people started to be closer to each other inside of the society that we speak with each other. And this is also what happened in the first months of this uh, stage of war that uh, also cultural actors which were probably never collaborating with each other started to collaborate or cultural actors who, yeah, who uh, would probably never collaborate started to collaborate where we started like to put some not super relevant things a little bit behind and not to search, I don't know, 50 shades, who is more feminist and who is less feminist, but like to concentrate on common action. And this is, uh, this was also the time when I found a lot of counterparts with whom we also not working before, because people just came closer to each other and they also came kind of closer to the walls and trying to understand what's going on. And we have a question. First of all, thank you a lot for a very interesting presentations. Uh, I have a question. Nowadays, there are obviously a lot of artists who live outside of Ukraine. And what is the relationship between those who left and uh, those who stayed? And uh, other artists who left participate in the exhibitions inside the country and how it works? And do those who stayed have a feeling that they make different experiences and that those who left would not understand them? Uh, yeah, like uh, basically this uh, these communities, I would say it's um, it's it's a compromise that people understand that they make different experiences. Like like oh, when you're outside and when you're inside, it's different experience. But also still in our residences, the artists were discussing. Okay, when I'm here in the Valley of Kids, can I uh, speak about Bucha? Because I'm also not there. How close should they be to catastrophe in order to be authorized? To speak about this catastrophe. Yeah, it's also like this question also inside Ukraine, like, like this proximity to the line which is there. Um, and this is also a very, like, uh, the situations are very diverse, like in some constellations people are supportive to each other, in some constellations there are also some tensions uh, between people which is happening. I hope, uh, like, it's my really great, great hope that uh, we can uh, really understand as, a, as an artistic community that this is this whole experience is the experience, the experience of those who are outside and inside. Otherwise, it's like this experience is not integral. We just have to put it together in order to see the full picture. And that is why from this year we started also to make residences, more mixed residences for the artists who are staying inside Ukraine and for, for the artists who left in order to bring them in tandems and to let them work together. We just call them artists in exile and uh, artists for local there. It's also connected uh, to the legal frameworks in different countries because like, they are staying in Poland, they can live almost as far as, uh, as, as uh, often as they want. If they live in Switzerland, they only have a small period of time when they can uh, go to Ukraine, even if they wanted to. So it's, it's really connected also to this legal framework, I see people who are just sharing these experiences and uh, know about that, yeah. But basically, uh, there are some tensions. There are some tensions, and it's a question how we will uh, work with them. Sometimes I'm uh, more optimistic, sometimes I'm uh, more pessimistic and uh, think that something like quote, some quotes in my hand, like, uh, enjoy the war, the peace will be terrible. 
but on next moment, I think, okay, we will manage it in order to come together. Yeah, it's complicated. And uh, also, like the last thing here in Ukraine, uh, 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 some kind of frustration uh, from the artists and cultural managers from Ukraine can also come from the fact that we are less here. Like we, I really feel it every day. We really feel it every day that we do miss people here. Like we miss uh, people. I mean, missing them as people who would like to have, but we are also like having not enough people to make the job we are doing. And it's uh, like it's felt like more and more and more. And some kind of frustration can also come from these pragmatical reasons because we need more people. We need more people power here. Yeah, and, and what's your point of view, Alexander? As you are in Kyiv, actually, yeah. I don't have a lot of uh, to add to this question, but yeah, I agree that it's a, it's a, uh, this diversity of experiences is one of the uh, subject of our uh, uh, future art and film uh, uh, development. And uh, for example, we have now. Uh, it is announced uh, the film festival docu days which will be in Kiev. And uh, as I, my colleagues were in this uh, selection committee and they shared the list of films with me. And what I discovered is that a lot of uh, um, films produced by Ukrainians who are not in Ukraine, some of them produced by uh, international teams uh, uh, from by people who were in Ukraine, but they're not Ukrainians, but it's you see the films about war. And of course, some films are they are about uh, Ukrainian experience in uh, on levels because uh, the team is here, the, the team is uh, worked in the front line, and the uh, protagonists they're also in quite, quite uh, terrible circumstances. So, yes, this diversity, I really like this idea that it's one of new main subject in this Ukrainian, uh, uh, general Ukrainian narrative discussion. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you so much for your presentations. I uh, might be mistaken with the quote, but now it came to my mind. I think, uh, so I'm not sure if it was exactly like that, but it was it was coming from infamous Vetrovich. Uh, Back then we had of this in, uh, Ukrainian Institute of uh, National Memory. And I think like uh, it was my it was before the uh, last February, but he was saying something like that now, uh, like we are done with decolonization, kind of now it's time for decolonization. So it was like something like that. And he was like one of these kind of proponents of this decolonization de de policies in Ukraine. So uh, and I know that this uh, so my question is about that. Uh, and of course it's very broad and we can speak like for, uh, for Long time, but actually it also comes as in for three of you, also a question for you for uh, with Kiev you know, because we will be touching upon this topic in the previous edition. But to put it kind of simpler, uh, my question would be like, if this notion of decolonization in the institutions you're working on, uh, in, uh, how, like, is it part of your kind of institutional work if you see it, like, if it's formalized or informalized? Uh, maybe you can share like your opinions as a and to like to put it kind of shorter. Uh, is it part of your institutional activity or like uh, um, uh, how uh, how strong it is part of your institutional activity or like how focused it is? Uh, in our case, it's one of the topics, uh, but so as we are staying inside Ukraine, so it's not the topic that uh, like very, very much external and you probably understand it in a different way. Uh, in, uh, on post Impresa, uh, we launched a series of texts about decolonization and what it is. And for us, it's important to see decolonization as also internal process inside yourself. So you have to decolonize yourself. There is nobody who will do this for you in a way. And this is what we are trying also to bring through this text. Is that, for example, the colonization of theater is not only taking out the works of uh, Russian writers, Russian drama writers out of theater and let the theater work on the same terms with sexism, with vertical structures and so on. It's not working. So we are trying to work with this term and also to see how we can do this to ourselves. Yeah, please, Alexander. 
Uh, thank you for this question. It's, uh, it's really close to the uh, events that our institution. Uh, Could you please uh, keep the microphone closer? Sorry, to sorry, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's very, I, I said that it's uh, one of the topic in the Ozenka Center because, uh, we, as I mentioned, that uh, the heritage uh, that we uh, operate with is. Uh, uh, common, it's just like a Soviet heritage, which is which we need to divide or not to divide. And this discussion started even before 2014, I guess. Uh, well, what is Ukrainian and should we do we need to uh, make these borders and, uh, between some uh, Soviet influences and general Soviet influences, Ukrainian influences? And now we have like a new dimension of these discussions. And of course, uh, you mentioned decolonization, decolonization also, as I as I heard. Right, right, right. Was it's it's, it's really really interesting uh, uh, to compare uh, because this discussion uh, about decolonization, which was very active between in this age of not full invasion, but uh, the war the war was going, but uh, not full invasion. But this in that time, this discussion was uh, uh, very active, and uh, it was a bit controversial in Ukrainian society because there were people who, and I was one of those people who had uh, uh, thought that um, we do not, we need to rethink and uh, reinvent uh, our attitudes to the Soviet heritage, but not to uh, to broke it and to uh, cancel it uh, totally. Uh, but in uh, in the case of decolonization, uh, the uh, situation is definitely uh, other because uh, people, almost all people, they're, they're not called discussion because almost all uh, actors in this discussion, they agreed that Ukrainians should uh, to have this stage of decolonization. Uh, but the problem is that even uh, we, I heard this, uh, uh, idea about decolonization a lot, but unfortunately we don't have, uh, as I see, in my opinion, we don't uh, have enough. Uh, so we, all the people uh, mean something they are personal in this decolonization uh, idea. We don't have a kind of fundamental uh, discussion and of some uh, sources uh, which we are, uh, could use in this uh, discussion uh, and. Uh, some people think that Ukraine should uh, have this stage of post-colonization before decolonization. So it's uh, a big humanitarian discourses, and I I really glad that we have it. Uh, but uh, in terms of film heritage, in terms of uh, this common history, of course, uh, for us uh, it became more important to emphasize uh, Ukrainian. Uh, some Ukrainian autonomy in the Soviet project, it, it, and uh, this is a kind of new approach to us and to historians also. Uh, it's not; it doesn't mean that all uh, every, uh, all bad that we had in our history it's came from Russia or from or from Soviet authorities. That means that we should to have uh, not only. Um, that we should have also common responsibility for some uncomfortable parts of our past, uh, but uh, uh, also we should understand in current situation, it's really, really clear, clear that uh, only Russia is aggressor, is aggressor and only uh, Russia destroyed uh, our culture, heritage and our lives in general. So uh, it's uh, very vivid discussion because it's uh, the war in, in process and uh, I guess in the, that in if we met each other maybe in three months or in half a year the our opinions could could change but uh, yeah it's a very good question because it's really uh, the discussion that we really need now yeah you, you're already there. okay so um uh, well, basically, I think um, that you somehow uh, also forgot to, <laughs> but this decommunization, decolonization, uh, it, it's also, you know, um, it's very much somehow based on the de-referentialization 
you know, because it, it's also we are missing the proper really reference to what we exactly mean, because I, I, I basically don't think that uh, these two phenomena are necessarily connected. And I don't think that uh, this so-called decommunization is um, somehow in line or with, with the decolonization uh, discourse. At the same time, uh, as a, as a yeah, th this this uh, discursive framework is is also a Western product, right? So it was brought uh, to the East uh, from the West, and this product has been based on a totally different premises, which are not really very much fit into to the Eastern Europe. And at the same time, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I know that it's a kind of a fashion, right? Like, yeah, especially in, in the cultural field in the West, uh, like every every institution is doing something on, on some decoloniality. But I basically don't believe in this. I, I think that what is really required is proper anti-colonialism, not some decoloniality, because it's uh, I, I'm I'm not really so. My problem with that is that actually when when a really uh, important uh, and necessary and so much needed uh, political actions are just being shifted to the cultural field to the soft sphere and then depoliticized and then exploited by different uh, institutions or whoever right and then it's just uh, hollowed out and uh, uh, so, and th then afterwards uh, yeah I, I don't think that we can uh, uh, can arrive at at at, uh, at a really kind of a satisfactory point where we can see that yeah this is like over that we somehow decolonize something uh, but also I think those processes are somehow yeah, they are the results. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the problem is that uh, the more uh, destruction you have, the more self-destruction you get. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, the logic, uh, very unfortunately, that we are in this uh, today. But that's the logic of this uh, full-scale violence that it always backfires. And uh, yeah, I mean, objectively, you can understand that, but at the same time, this is like, um, yes, economic is vegan. It, it's like acting out, right? So I don't think that there is a, uh, the, the, yeah, I mean, because instead of that, what, what is really needed, you, you have to, to, um, to apply justice uh, forcefully, of course, because there is no other way, as we know from the European history. First, you apply justice to the to to the aggressors, to the exploiters, right? And that's what is needed. I mean, then uh, because otherwise we will go just in this uh, kind of uh, fashionable discursivity, which which I believe leads leads nowhere. So I am rather for repolitization of this uh, of this um, phenomena than just using this as kind of uh, uh, catchy uh, concepts, uh, even uh, within the biennial included. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but this is really long. Uh, yeah. uh, so if, if there are perhaps no, are there any other questions? So yeah, for, uh, here I think we can uh, put a comma. And uh, so thank you so much, Alexander, again for it's very it's such a pity that you couldn't uh, make it uh, in person. Thank you, Alona, so much. Thank you so much, Depo, again. Uh, yeah, I hope you continue. Yeah. So now Alexander will present uh, a film that we are going to screen and uh, yeah, enjoy. Yes, okay. So we are today tonight we are going to see please keep a microphone, sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry. Uh one more time. Tonight we are going to watch Pig Pigs will be Pigs or Upki Station. It's a film, Ukrainian uh, film uh, from 1931. It was produced in Odessa and uh, in uh, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. And uh, again, as we are talking about decolonizing, uh, I would like to spotlight that it was uh, not just a Soviet film, it was a Soviet Ukrainian film, because uh, in that period, especially in that period, in 20s and uh, until early 40s, uh, Ukrainian cultural policies and sometimes political policies, they were quite autonomous of, uh, from uh, a metropoly, and uh, we have really gold era of Ukrainian uh, silent cinema in that time and uh, this film is one of uh, example of this era so uh, Pigs is uh, quite uh, uh, witty and satirical silent comedy 
uh, which uh, makes fun of the Soviet bureaucracy, uh, hardly in line with the historical challenges of, of that day, of that period. And it also has a, some, uh, uh, some formalism uh, as a method because of this absurdity. And uh, as you will see, uh, disorder and sabotage, and uh, it's uh, some approaches that uh, these uh, avant-garde movements uh, used in that time. Uh, the plot is very simple of this film. It's uh, the an accident occurred at the Pupki. It's the name of railway station. And uh, people discovered two illegal passengers in the train. It's Guinea Peaks. Uh, and uh, these animals, as uh, it always could be in, in such kind of uh, comic films, that became a reason of some uh, interesting uh, events. And uh, the head of this station is trying to solve the problem, but animals uh, in, in the wagon uh, with grain uh, has been lost and the situation uh, gets out of control. And you will see uh, how it finished, um, and, and finish with the critic of this bureau Soviet bureaucracy. Because uh, in the end, it's not a spoiler, but in the end, some after a lot of these bureau bureau bureaucratic turns, some uh, uh, audit committee uh, will come to solve the problem. But of course, uh, the problem won't be couldn't be solved in such kind of problem. And uh, what is important? To add that film was uh, produced by Hanan Schmein. He was a director and uh, he was uh, influenced also by uh, some avant garde uh, methods. Uh, and the evidence is that uh, Hanan Schmein, he was uh, one of the directors in uh, Ukrainian prominent Brazil theater from that period. And so he was a uh, uh, follower of Les Kurbas, uh, head of this Brazil theater. What is interesting maybe for you is that Les Kurbas, he was studying in uh, Vienna uh, shortly uh, and his uh, follower, Hanan Schmein, created this film. And uh, also some um, information about how we found it because we, it's this film considered uh, as a lost for a long time. But in 2015, uh, in our Dzhenka Center, had uh, some correspondence with uh, German Federal Archive and uh, Russian fil film researcher Pyotr Bagrov, and we discovered that uh, this, the copy of this film uh, in 35 millimeters, uh, it's uh, preserved in the German Federal Archive. And uh, well, next year, in August uh, of 2016, Thanks to Ukrainian uh, embassy in Germany, uh, these seven reels of these uh, uh, films uh, were returned to Ukraine, and we created a new copy. We have scanned this film and restored it, and asked uh, Ukrainian musician Albert Ukrenko to uh, commission him to write a new music score to this film. So it, it is a silent film, but you will hear this contemporary absurdic also and satiric music by Albert Skrenko. So I wish you a good screening and thank you very much, Depo and Vasil and everybody in the audience for this event. Thanks so much. Yeah. Ну все, скажи, мы можем тогда просто прощаться, да. Я скажу, я побачимся, да. Пока. Счастливо. Shall we close this? Okay. Right? Ah, so very